Wunderschönen guten Tag und herzlich willkommen bei Crowd Gaming. Wir reden über Crisis 3 und zwar mit Michael Reed, Producer bei Crytek. Und wir erläutern mit ihm, warum Crisis so ähnlich ist wie Star Wars, was für Nerdporn die noch in Zukunft machen wollen und noch mal ein paar neue Einsichten über Crisis 3. Das gibt es jetzt im Interview auf Crowd Gaming. All right, Michael, thank you for taking your time to have a little chat with us. Congratulations on your awesome reveal of the multiplayer details um, here on Gamescom. I hope you enjoy the uh, trade fair. Yeah, it's great. This is my third time at Gamescom, and uh, it's always an enjoyable experience. Lots of people coming out, seeing the products. So in Crisis 3, you're obviously telling a little more about the story of what is happening, and uh, I hope we are getting introduced to some more iconic events and characters but in the franchise we're already having some of them uh, one is the island we know from crisis one does that have kind of returned to explain how the island is related to what's happening in new york well we haven't been back to the island yet i mean these are some of the burning questions from crisis one that you know people really really want to know about um, for right now, Crisis 3, so Crisis 3 takes place 20 years after the events, 20 plus years after the events of Crisis 2. So we're back in New York City again. Uh, so there was, there was a war that happened between the Cell and the Ceph, and what, what the Cell did was end up building these domes over top of all the major cities worldwide. So Crisis 3 comes back yet again to New York, to the Liberty Dome, which is the dome built over New York City, but there's some other dark, evil things that are going on inside this dome. And that's why we're coming back to New York yet again to, uh, to finish this segment of Crisis 3. But when you look at Crisis as the entire franchise or the Crisis universe, so to speak, we have uh, so many different things and so many, so many different things to talk about, so many ways we can go with the franchise. So Crisis 3 is going to answer some of those burning questions that people had. Not all of them, but it's going to clear up a few things. How do you avoid the lost moments of, oh, I mean, the, the series lost moments of having too many unanswered questions? And are there any? No, it allows us, I mean, it, it, it allows us for a lot more flexibility in, in where we can take things. So we really wanted to end the trilogy off with something big. Uh, you return as, as Prophet, who's a well-known Crisis character from Crisis One and uh, had a little bit of a role at the beginning of Crisis 2 and of course at the end of Crisis 2, which some may rem remember. But we've brought back this time and, and we really feel that out of all the characters that we have portrayed throughout Crisis 1 and 2, that Prophet is probably going to be the strongest that we've, we've ever brought out. So for everyone asking themselves, why is Prophet back? They should better get back playing Crisis 2, uh, right? Well, that would definitely help. That helps piece together some of the stuff. So what we're actually we're going to do in Crisis 3 is we're going to put in uh, some of the backstory elements. There's going to be a segment in there that goes back and kind of tells the stories of Crisis 1 and Crisis 2 and sort of what happened after and, and a little bit in between. So we'll be able to clear up some of that. But going through Crisis 1 and Crisis 2, Crisis 2 was really more of a technological focus. We, we really had a, a large tech focus in Crisis 2. But we're coming back in this one in some of the greatest elements we had in Crisis 1 and Crisis 2 and really combining those into and having a much deeper story element and character development and characters you actually care about. So uh, one of the char characters uh, many players care about is Nomad from Crisis 1. Can we see him again or Maybe somewhere in the Crisis universe, but as of right now, I mean, we're kind of leaving off. We're leaving the Crisis One story and where that kind of ended. And where where is Nomad today has really sort of moved away from where we're at now with the Crisis story. But we have a lot of, like I said, with the Crisis universe as a whole, we have a lot of potential to really come back and, and explain that via many different media methods, whether it be in games or in comics or in prime fiction or books or any of this other stuff. So here on Gamescom, you revealed a whole lot of details about the multiplayer in Crisis 3, and many gamers are worrying about the shift of focus that is happening there. Uh, is Crisis 3 still a fully valid single-player game? 
It, absolutely. I mean, Crisis, the Crisis series has always been known for its single, its really strong single player story and, and action sequences. And we're going to we're going to have a continuation of that, and we're also going to reinforce uh, everything that we've done with the story and, of course, with the gameplay as well. So it's important to note that when you're developing games like this, you have a single player element and a multiplayer element. They're very much independent. They're developed independently. So there's really not a focus shift. I mean. The single player guys that have been working on the game really defined what is the art direction, where things are going, and then of course taking a lot of those elements with the bow and all the different attachments and weapons that we have and incorporating those and shifting the gameplay just enough so that it's a more enjoyable multiplayer experience. So. To say that one is over the other, absolutely not. I mean, we have a we have a good focus on both ends of that. Awesome. So in the first trailers of Crisis 3, we always had a strong focus on the Cry Engine, and you showed off many effects that the Cry Engine um, uses, and it's kind of rare that a engine developer uh, has its cards so open to the gamers about what they are doing with their engines. Is uh, crisis for Crytek, what Star Wars is for ILM, like doing a product to show what you can do. Absolutely. I mean, there's a trade-off that happens between all the work we do on the CryEngine and all the work we do on Crisis and all of the other all of the other things we have in development at Crytek. So they kind of work back and forth with maybe sometimes the CryEngine guys will come up with something unique or something interesting that that we can utilize in game. And sometimes we have the guys on the Crisis who work on the Crisis series come up with something unique, and the CryEngine guys are like, "How did you do that?" And then we incorporate that and we incorporate that into the engine itself. So, but without having really dedicated goals and having these games that are being made, we couldn't really progress the engine without that. And we can take all that we learn, not only from ourselves, but from our licensees, and then bring that into the engine to provide an experience so people can go out and use the engine. I mean, everybody knows at this point, we have a free SDK, the engine's available for free. You can get around and get in and play around with it with a lot of the same tools that everybody else has to, to play around with. So uh, these videos about CryEngine are, um kind of labeled nerd porn. Yes. I, I, are you going to release some more nerd porn? Absolutely. I mean, like I said, the, the, the CryEngine is really at the heart of what, of what we're able to do to reach the hyper-realism that, that we want to get to. Um, that video really took off, especially our top secret tessellated toad tech, which that was a real tongue twister. Uh, but oh. showing, showing, yeah, exactly. I'm surprised <laughs> I even got that one right. But we got, so it is, I mean, tech porn is really the, really the best way to put it. And it was very well received with some of the stuff we were doing. And then taking what we did in that map for Crisis 3 and really just popping that out and showing off some of the tech and what we're able to achieve. In the future, we'll definitely be seeing more of that and, and using our products to help showcase our engine. Uh, in, on the internet, there was kind of a, I wouldn't call it a shitstorm, but there was some ranting about the way the bird in the beginning of the trailer was moving. How do you think about such yes. criticism? Well, there was. There was some feedback on that. I mean, if, if that's what all people really have to complain about is the bird, I mean, you know, we need to, we, we need to go back and tweak that maybe a little bit more and have it a little bit softer, you know, like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's some things where we're still very much working on and, uh, you know, if, if all people had to complain about was the bird, then, you know, I think we're doing okay. <laughs> All right, Micah, thanks a lot for that interview. Thanks for the insight. I hope you have a great time in Cologne. I do. Thank you.